International Study College, m a h a j u l a l o n g k o n University, just joined the program. Before we start, um, if anybody just open your voice, please mute it first, so that it's it's not disturbed to other people. And for today, for the subject is the innovative mindfulness in practice, and uh, we are very proud and very feel honor that the Go Global Minds Collective, driven by a diverse team of profession. Professionals, researchers, and practitioners that commit to the um, mindful social innovation, and the goal is to improve men in mental health and well-being. So today, we International Buddhist Study College (MCU) are deeply honored to have the opportunity to learn from this expert. May I introduce as Associate Professor Dr. Aline McDougall, who is the founder of the Global Minds Collective, has uh, devoted her time to teach our PhD and MA student, and also the team she's joined by Natalie uh, Matias, Director of Learning and Development and r e a d Trainer. And Dr. Sarah Hunter, lead trainer and facilitator, please extend a warm welcome to the Global Minds Collective teams. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. In Thailand, it is our evening, so thank you for that. I'm Dr. Arlene McDougall, and I am the CEO and founder of the Global Minds Collective, which is a registered charity located in London, Canada. And we're very thrilled and honored uh, to be with you today to talk about some uh, of our work with respect to innovative mindfulness and practice. So we'll begin uh, today with just offering, um, I believe, a land acknowledgement. This is something that's very important to us in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. Some of you may be aware that Canada, as uh, other Western countries, have uh, a dark past in terms of how uh, the government and other entities have treated our Indigenous peoples, and we are on a pathway of truth and reconciliation. We actually um, every year on September 30th honor um, truth and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples in Canada. But one of the things that um, many institutions, including our own, have committed to is just offering a land acknowledgement to recognize um, our Indigenous peoples' contributions, past and current, to the land. So I'll I'll offer that right now. So we at the Global Minds Collective uh, acknowledge that we're located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lene Puak, and the Chang'ongtin nations, on lands that are connected with important treaties, including the London Township and Samba Treaties and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampong. With this, we respect the long-standing relationships that Indigenous nations have had to this land, as they are the original caretakers. We acknowledge both historical and ongoing injustices that Indigenous peoples, which includes First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, have endured in Canada, and we accept responsibility as an institution. To contribute toward revealing and correcting miseducation, as well as renewing respectful relationships with Indigenous communities through our teaching, our research, and our community service. Thank you. All right. So on to our agenda for today's session. We have a lot of things that we hope to cover. And at any point, we really encourage anybody on this call 
to put their questions into their chat or to raise your hand and just engage in an ongoing discussion. So please do not hesitate if there is something that you want to share or ask. So we will do some group introductions. Um, I'll then uh, talk about us as uh, the Global Minds Collective and our beginnings and where we're at and what our mission and vision are. We'll talk about some of the work we're doing with respect to the mindful movement in various institutions and sectors in our society, as well as some of the research that has been done on our mindfulness and social emotional competency curriculum. And then Natalie and Sarah are going to dive in to discovering mindfulness and providing our session templates and really looking at uh, the concept that's very, very applicable um, to today's world around trauma-informed mindfulness and how to do that in practice. All right, I'm gonna ask Natalie to lead us through an opening practice, our mindful breathing exercise of Tuza. Thank you. Thanks, Arlene. Just taking a moment now, uh, we wanted to start off our presentation, uh, just how we would normally uh, start one of our mindfulness practices or sessions of our program. Um, and so this is one of our core mindfulness practice called Tuza. Um, it was named by a participant in Kigali, Rwanda, when we first started training with this program. Um, and Tuza in Kigali, Rwanda uh, means to slow down and to, to learn how to slow down uh, before reacting. So uh, we welcome you to just take some time. If you'd like to turn off your video or just stay as you are, you can. And get comfortable in um, your seated position, your meditation uh, that would support your meditation practice. And our practices are really short, so they're only about three to five minutes. So whenever you're ready, just taking some time to take your eyes off the screen and maybe finding a soft gaze on the floor or if it feels comfortable, closing your eyes. Just let yourself be present to the body. Be present to the heart. and be present to the connection of everyone sharing time and space together here this morning. Take a moment to ground in the soles of your feet or in your sit bones if you're sitting on the ground and connect to the earth underneath you. Notice the palms on your on your lap or on your side. And take a moment to allow your shoulders to relax any amount away from your ears. Notice how your body feels here in this moment. And when you're ready, if you haven't already, start to pay attention to your breath. Notice the breath entering the body on the in-breath and notice the breath leaving the body on the out-breath. And we invite you to be here for five breaths on your own, taking as much time as you need, to just settle and be.
letting each new breath be a new beginning and each out breath to settle in awareness. Taking these last few moments to be with whatever you might need in your practice. And when you're ready, slowly coming back to the space, maybe inviting gentle movement. Noticing how you feel and letting that guide you and support you as we spend the next two and a half hours together. Maybe coming back to the space and if you see uh, the people in the little grid, the little screens, just taking a moment to connect with everyone here um, and even the names on the screen if some people aren't on video. And after our practice, we always like to start with a little check in. Um, and we're going to do this in the chat box. So um, I see there's 43 of us here. So typically, we'd like to go uh, one by one in a circle. But for timing sakes, we'll do this in the chat box. Um, if you haven't already, I know I could see some uh, people with um, numbers. Uh, it would be nice to know your name. So if you could share your name by uh, going to the participant list and just share uh, editing your name so you could highlight uh, more and then you could say rename. Um, but if your name is already there, uh, you could pop into the chat box and we would love to know one character trait that you are bringing to today's session. So for instance, some people will say they like to bring curiosity, they like to bring compassion. Uh, so what are we bringing to today's uh, lecture? And I see people already uh, bringing in curiosity, experience, a beginner's mind. Take as much time as you need to just reflect and then share in the chat box. Thank you, Kesrin. I see they're bringing loving kindness. Thank you. We receive that. We connect with that. Kyoko, openness. Thank you. Thank you, Fra. Thank you, Gim. Thank you, Yang. Peace, love, joy, curiosity, presence coming into our circle. And presence. I'll give a couple more minutes. You're also welcome to pass if you're still kind of sitting with your practice. That's okay too. Happiness. I love that. Saturday morning happiness. Peace, inner peace. Thank you. Calmness and awareness to open to all new things. <laughs> we love that. curiosity. And even as I read this, and you're welcome to go back and read them on your own, uh, just noticing the sensations that arise as we feel all of these character traits or the energy behind it, we could sense it um, as we experience just like loving kindness from distances and miles. Um, we can really feel this from Canada across 
uh, the country. Thank you so much. And I'll pass it back to Arlene. I'm gonna continue just uh, acknowledging everyone in the chat box. Feel free to continue to share uh, your character trait that you're bringing today. Thank you. Well, I'd like to start off by telling the story of why uh, or how the Global Minds Collective um, became and originated. And um, I know this sounds a bit silly, but it started with a washcloth, a knitted washcloth, similar to the picture on the screen. I was a psychiatry resident training in Canada, but I had an, ex an opportunity to go to Guyana, which is a small country in South America that um, was very much struggling in terms of providing mental health care to their population. And we were there to work with the Ministry of Health on how we could build capacity in uh, family physicians, general physicians in the practice of psychiatry. So one of the experiences was to go to the National Psychiatric Hospital, which for decades had been very run down and certainly not practicing psychiatry in a way that was consistent with human rights. But under the leadership of the current Minister of Health at the time, there was a lot of positive change. And so when we got there, we were obviously, you know, foreigners, and we were with the Minister of Health, so it was a big hubbub. And they created a marketplace. So many of the patients who were long term residents and had been very much removed from the community, and marginalized and isolated, had created a marketplace for us where they had um, tables of the various art, you know, crafts, um, handmade items that they had had created to sell. So I bought a ton of things, including some knitted washcloths. And I'll never forget the face of the woman who likely had, you know, a diagnosis of a very severe, persistent mental illness, the pride that she had in creating something by hand and giving it to somebody who found it valuable and would use it. And although it sounds very simple, to me, that was the spark in trying to understand how we can create interventions, approaches that fell out of our typical sort of biological medical approach to mental health issues and how we can look at, you know, entrepreneurism, um, various social supports and expand what we even understood as the mental health care system or as mental health intervention. So of course I knew nothing about entrepreneurship. I knew nothing about social innovation because they don't train you as a doctor in any of that, of course. And so when I went back to Canada, I learned and I approached others that did have experience in social entrepreneurship and social innovation and uh, largely in Canada, but I did connect to people from across the world. And I became obviously a student of that. And it became very clear to me that my toolkit as a psychiatrist, as a doctor was very limited. So although I could make diagnoses and although I could, you know, prescribe medications or order tests or even do psychotherapy for many of the people that I was trying to heal and treat, those were not enough because they lived in a system that had so many barriers, whether it was stigma or discrimination or other forms of social exclusion, poverty, homelessness, many complex social issues that a pill is not going to solve. One hour of psychotherapy is not going to solve and a diagnosis isn't going to solve. And so it, very quickly as a young psychiatrist and academic, I learned that I needed to think much broader in terms of what our system was and what healing meant and what recovery meant. And then that's where I began to look at social innovation tools and approaches. Now, at the same time, as I'm beginning to realize 
um, the limits of sort of the biomedical approach to the treatment of mental health issues. I also became a student of mindfulness. And I'm going to be totally honest with everyone today. In my 20s, when I first began to be acquainted with mindfulness, it was really in a functional way, like, oh, this is going to help me manage stress better. Oh, this is going to help me sleep better. It wasn't a spiritual um, approach. It was more like how it would be helpful and make me more effective as a person or how it could potentially help my patients. Now, of course, as I continued to progress, I kept deepening and deepening and deepening my practice of mindfulness and what it meant to transform, what it meant to transcend and what it meant to become my authentic self. And as I was doing this in conjunction with social innovation, I realized that if we were gonna create spaces for people who don't normally work together, who don't normally even talk, to come together to try to understand complex challenges in the mental health care system in Canada and abroad, we would need to do this in a very mindful and intentional way where we created a space for people to present their authentic selves, including their vulnerabilities and come from a place of deep intention where it wasn't about reacting, but it was about responding and creating a system of mental health care that was consistent with compassion and kindness and love. And so as this journey came together, I realized if we were going to create system transformation, we needed to bring the tools and processes of social innovation together with the practice of mindfulness and social and emotional learning together. And so that really is the story of the Global Minds Collective. And what we're, you know, doggedly committed to is how do we create spaces for people to practice mindfulness as well as to see themselves as an agent of change and to work with others as an agent of change together in a very authentic and intentional way to be the system change makers that we need in today's society, whether we're dealing with complex challenges of mental health and addictions or climate change or other social challenges, including poverty and homelessness, and they're all related, how are we going to do that? So our vision is to create a world of meaningful opportunities for flourishing mental health and well-being. And we're going to do this by educating, connecting, and mobilizing mindful social innovators to catalyze both system and at the same time, in conjunction, self-transformation for global mental health and well-being. And we will do this in local, international, and Indigenous contexts with various community, including Indigenous partners. And so this is kind of at the crux of the Global Minds Collective. This notion that if you want change, quote, out there, it has to come at the same time as you're changing in here. So I know this sounds very simplistic. But if we want a more compassionate mental health care, health care system, how are we, whether you're a doctor or a nurse or a family member or a patient or whatever role, and we all carry so many roles and so many hats, how are we embodying compassion in all that we do? And it's not just on our website. It's not just on our t-shirt. It's how we practice in our mind, in our decision-making, in our communication, and in our action. And so we believe through these four pillars of our pedagogy and curriculum that we can achieve this notion of self and system transformation. So the first pillar is disruption. This is really speaking to social innovation tools and processes. So what I mean by social innovation is really taking the process of, you know, design, ideation, co-creation, 
um, but doing it in a highly social collaborative way. So bringing together people who have a stake in whatever challenge, particularly the people who are most affected and are the, the beneficiaries of any solution. And often these, these people are typically not at the table and do not have leadership or decision-making opportunities. So really it's about power giving and power sharing. And so, for example, in mental health care, it's how do we work with people with lived experience of mental illness and addictions, their family members, their advocates, providers, frontline providers, system leaders, researchers, and other academics. And then how do we go across sectors? So the way we see, for example, the mental health care system, it's not just the hospital. It's not just the clinic. It's also our workplaces. It's our educational spaces. It's our community spaces. So how do we ensure these different sectors? It's our legal and justice system. How do we ensure that these sectors come together? We're all dealing with the same complex challenges and yet we don't talk and we don't work together to develop solutions. So this pillar of disruption is about bringing people that are very diverse with their knowledge and experience together in a way that we can co-understand what the complex challenges and root causes of them are, and then work through uh, designing and ideating, testing and implementing our solutions and doing it in a very rapid way. So it's not a 10 year research study. It's about how do we innovate more quickly because people are hurting and suffering now. And so we need to be very nimble and quick. So that's the disruption pillar. System leadership pillar. This is about how we can understand leadership in the way that it's character-based. So how do we enhance and facilitate character-based leadership? So making sound you know, ethical decisions, um, leading from the heart, being open-minded. I saw many people provide that. Um, uh, justice, um, prudence. Um, kindness, how do we enhance character leadership? And at the same time, how do we acknowledge that any complex challenge requires multiple leaders coming from different institutions and sectors working together um, towards this common goal? So it's not just going to be one person or one organization that's going to solve this challenge. So it's really about, again, getting to that place of radical partnership and that sharing of power um, to be a system leader. The next pillar is transformational learning. So our curriculum is all about the experience. Yes, we have content. Yes, we have, you know, certain assignments and you know, expectations. But at the end of the day, we want people to experience the change themselves within and outside themselves. So all of our curriculum is designed to help people move from a passive vessel of education to an active change maker and to see and feel themselves that way. And so um, we look at, um, for example, real challenges as part of the learning so that our students are figuring out in real time what are potential solutions and how do I work with these community partners to enact those solutions and evaluate them and then iterate on them based on the feedback of the evaluation. And then our last pillar is, you know, at the heart of it all. And we call this pillar being and becoming. So this is really, again, going back to that practice at the center of mindfulness, of social emotional learning, and more broadly, creating space for sacred practice. So we understand that we're going to be working with communities that have uh, very you know, culturally informed sacred practices that are intrinsic to their identity and to their healing. And so how do we ensure that we create those respectful spaces, that those practices and those knowledges can be shared and integrated into the understanding and solution development for whatever complex challenge we're looking to address collectively? Thank 
to. So a little bit about our impact. We have worked in different areas of the world. We are still nascent. We're still babies in this space. But I just want to highlight a few different areas where we have worked with community partners um, in this approach. So a lot of our beginnings began in Kenya, where we worked with uh, community partners in an area um, just southeast of Nairobi called Machakos, um, working with community organizations, hospitals, community agencies, and people with lived experience, as well as university students from across Kenya and faculty, as well as university students from Canada, coming together to create a very mindful social innovation space, working on identified priority challenges of the community. And so a lot of our work really began in Kenya and I'm very fond of all the people who contributed to the integration of mindfulness in our social innovation curriculum through that process. Since then, we've also done work again with students largely. So these are master's level students. I mentioned that because I know there's master's students and uh, other uh, graduate students on this call working in countries facing major uh, mental health crises and associated challenges in sub-Saharan Africa, including Somalia, uh, South Sudan, and Nigeria, where we had our university students in Canada closely working with community partners in those countries to design and implement solutions using the mindful social innovation approach. And again, the challenges have always been identified by the local community as priorities. We have an ongoing project in El Salvador, really looking at how the post-Civil War and the various um, forms of trauma and violence that have continued through gang violence and political violence, how we can work in particularly with young people um, who have experienced intergenerational trauma to create solutions for their mental health and well-being using mindful social innovation labs. And then um, we also have worked with community partners in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in a highly conflictual area of South Kivu, uh, creating solutions, particularly for, again, high school students um, dealing with ongoing community violence and enabling them to become mindful social innovators themselves. So we've adapted our curriculum for high schools, university students, community practitioners, as well as leaders. And then in London, Ontario, Canada, where we're, I'm based um, and where the um, charity is headquartered, we are working um, through the university, but also through um, my research lab at the hospital on how we can create mindful social innovation opportunities um, for people with severe mental illness. Uh, we've worked with refugees and new immigrants, indigenous peoples, as well as graduate students. And so we'll continue to do this work uh, with our local, our indigenous and our global partners um, and continue to create you know, change makers in a variety of communities across um, the world. So um, this is not news to any of you all, but there's certainly over the last uh, many years been a growing mindfulness movement and we have hopefully had a small role, but an important role in that. And we continue to play um, a role in that movement in terms of planting seeds of mindfulness across university campuses, uh, which we've done in Canada, the US and uh, Mexico in particular, uh, in addition to what I've shared, as well as in the healthcare system and other institutions, including policing and other first responders in Canada. And I'm gonna share a little bit about what we're doing actively with respect to uh, catalyzing mental health system transformation in London, Ontario, Canada through um, my lab at the hospital called Minds of London Middlesex. And just to start, I should mention the Minds of Global Minds and this other lab called Minds of London Middlesex stands for 
mental health incubator for disruptive solutions. <laughs> so it's a mouthful, but it's really about, again, bringing minds, very for various forms of minds together in a mindful way to create solutions. So the way that we've um, uh, really taken uh, an approach to many complex challenges in the mental health system was to first ask the community, where should we begin? And uh, a broad group of stakeholders said, our young people, people who are transitioning from adolescence into adulthood. So what we describe as kind of that 16 year old to 25 year old age group, um, 75% of all mental illnesses and addictions begin before the age of 25. And we also know from our research in uh, that developmental phase that it's critical in terms of identity formation, education, career, relationship building, that you need to intervene early, if not prevent illness and addiction in order to maintain people's um, positive trajectory through their lifetime. And so when we did our initial research, looking at what was important for young people's mental health and well-being, the three big themes that came out was quality relationships, meaning and purpose, and development of resiliency and self-efficacy. And so for the last four to five years, we've really taken a social innovation and mindfulness approach, working with young people and other stakeholders to create solutions that honor those three uh, main um, concepts or constructs. And so I'll just give you a smattering of examples that we've developed. So one included um, people, young people wanting to share their story of their mental illness but wanting to do it in a way that was deeply therapeutic for themselves as well as for the audience who was receiving the story. And so we worked with uh, young people, with therapists, with researchers, with storytellers on creating a toolkit that helps young people understand uh, their mental health journey. And instead of becoming the poster child for mental health, becoming a storyteller that would help them move forward from their pain and their suffering and help others who are receiving the story to also um, heal. And so we created this whole safe storytelling toolkit and we're now partnering with another national organization um, to spread it across Canada and perhaps beyond. One of the other uh, big issues that we identified in our research was young people don't even want to necessarily go to the hospital or to speak to a clinic um, provider because they don't feel um, understood. They don't feel comfortable. Uh, they don't even know how to communicate with them because they don't pick up their phone to talk to people. They prefer text or uh, messaging. Um, they don't feel um, that that they're really safe. And so we've worked with many different uh, youth-centered practitioners um, to create a whole training program so that healthcare and social service providers can understand the principles of being youth-centered in their practice and know how to enact that in a day-to-day -day way. So that's a training program that we've created. And then starting last year, we've really shifted into trying to help the most severely affected by mental illness. So people that have uh, very complex, severe mental health and addiction issues that include experiencing of homelessness, poverty, and social exclusion, trauma, and violence. And um, we are now working across our city and region with many different uh, people with lived experience and institutions on these four sort of big areas. One is just making sense of the challenge. And we do this in traditional ways, surveys, interviews. But one of the things that we added was what we are calling uh, zine events. So these are um, mini magazines, almost like collages that people can creatively um, create in a group 
to talk about their story of mental health, what they would do if they could change it, and what have been some of the biggest challenges or barriers. And we have now worked with, I think, close to 150 young people, so from 16 to 35, that have mental illness and addiction to create their stories. And from that material, we've been able to um, filtrate down to six big themes of where our lab and our community needs to focus on um, in terms of creating change. And the way we're going to go about creating that change is through these three streams. One stream is called collective system innovation. This is really about bringing big groups of of people together, mostly people with lived experience of mental illness and addiction, and teaching them how to become mindful social innovators so that they are the center of creating change for the issues that most affect them. We also have a stream that's happening at the same time called mindful social innovation training. This is about a more intensive training program where providers and leaders of our mental health care system can become mindful social innovators themselves, which includes a big component of how am I going to do this in partnership with people with lived experience and people who I don't normally communicate with. So if we have a police officer, for example, taking our training program, how are they going to work with a teacher or um, a provider of homelessness um, services or um, a psychiatrist, you know, how are we gonna to come together across our sectors and our institutions to develop solutions with the people most affected? And then our third stream is really about knowledge exchange. And so we're creating a national as well as regional conferences called Imaginariums, where again, using that mindful social innovation approach, we bring people together who are trying to create system transformation so that we can learn from each other and not repeat and not be redundant in what we do, but instead um, adapt and scale. And at the same time, become an organized advocacy body so that we can go to the government, for example. We can go to decision makers and say, look, you know, what's working in this part of the country can work here, but we need more funding, more resources, and we will do this together in a networked way. And behind all this work is various uh, research. Um, and we're just going to highlight a few of the studies that have researched our curriculum in particular. Um, and I will start with the first one because this is the original research paper. And this was done under um, the previous charity, which uh, Global Minds Collective very gratefully took over uh, the intellectual property from. So this charity was called Mindfulness Without Borders and their founder um, was Theo Koffler, who you can see as one of the authors. So really looking at how this Mindfulness Ambassador uh, program could be used in high schools and not just any high schools, I should mention it was in Catholic high schools so how could a secular mindfulness program be adapted in uh, a faith-based school to assist young people with um, common mental health issues of anxiety and depression? And this was a qualitative study that had um, very positive results and really helped to catalyze its use in other schools. Myself as a psychiatrist, I was very, very interested in some of the early research looking at how mindfulness-based interventions could help people with some of the most severe mental illness, including schizophrenia and psychotic disorders, how they um, could improve what is known as the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. So our medications, our antipsychotic medications, they are effective not all the time, but most of the time in helping people with things like hallucinations and delusional thoughts. However, they run very short in terms of helping people with what's called the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. This includes a withdrawal, a lack of communication, a lack of motivation, a lack of thought. And there was some early research showing that mindfulness may actually be helpful for those negative symptoms. 
So I worked on adapting the Mindfulness Ambassador Program, which you'll hear more from Natalie and Sarah about for people with early psychosis. And we did a randomized controlled trial across three different sites, uh, hospital and community sites. And what we found was that it was effective in reducing negative symptoms, which just goes to show that, you know, mindfulness is so extremely um powerful and transformational that um, something that has um, been a big barrier for people's recovery for decades um, or longer uh, from schizophrenia can actually be um, amended and helped by mindfulness. We also have done research and I'm going to tap Sarah Hunter, who was one of the core researchers in this work on how we can improve the mental health and well-being of the healthcare providers, who in particular um, were at risk and were experiencing burnout through the pandemic. So Sarah, if you wanna just add a few key messages from this research. Yes, I'm happy to. Um, so in these studies, at the onset of COVID-19, um, one of the mental health hospitals in our region was looking at strategies to support healthcare worker persistence um, and their ability to stay resilient through the pandemic. So they took the program that we will be sharing with you today and modified it down to a reduced 30 minute program and offered it four times to their healthcare providers. Um, and healthcare providers within their study included anybody that was supporting the work of healthcare. So this was um, frontline practitioners to folks that were supporting things such as um, the cleaning and administration of healthcare, um, people who were supporting healthcare from um, home-based services or administrators in healthcare. And what they found um, here is we looked at the program's efficacy in terms of supporting burnout, reducing burnout and its ability to increase resiliency and empathy. And a large component of this was to see if a small brief intervention could support the ability of healthcare workers to still provide empathetic patient care. And this study was unique in many of the studies to date in mindfulness and healthcare worker um, persistence and burnout have looked at more robust mindfulness interventions. So we know that a lot of the literature suggests that more robust mindfulness programs um, have a really strong effect. Um, and what we wanted to discover here is if a small amount, um, if a very small dose of mindfulness could still have some of that same impact. Um, and what we found is that it, it does indeed. Um, back to you, Arlene. Thank you. And we also just wanted to share some of the work that's been done with more um, young people, students, including um, high school as well as post-secondary students. Um, so the second article I'm just going to mention, this article uh, was looking at um, students who are um, studying law and the stress that they uh, experienced when they received feedback which is so important, obviously, as part of our learning and as being a student. But for many people, um, it's deeply stressful because it's seen as critical. Um, and focusing on, you know, your, I guess, what you lack or what you 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 don't have. And when they taught students uh, the mindfulness practices, um, those students had much better uh, feedback literacy and less stress and less anxiety. Um, and there's been um, other research that isn't shown here today. Again, looking at uh, graduate students at the university level that um, with this type of curriculum integrated as part of their courses, um, that they experience much lower rates of anxiety, depression, and general stress indicators. Um, which of course, you know, appears to translate to better academic performance and uh, functioning. So we have had um, experience ourselves with offering our mindfulness course in the university setting um, as part of um, 
a, a course of uh, like a degree or certification course. Um, and we have only received positive feedback from our students saying that this was one of the most important things that they learned at the university and that they um, didn't realize that they needed it until they had it. I think so many of our young students um, and um, like particularly university students just sort of take, I guess, for granted that they're going to be stressed and have anxiety and depression as part of their learning experience. And when they uh, have the opportunity to step out of that and learn various skills and ways of being uh, and realizing it doesn't have to be that way. So we're going to continue to uh, work with post-secondary um, institutions to institute our education as well as to evaluate it in terms of mindfulness and social emotional learning. Okay. <laughs> Over to you, Natalie. Yeah, so now you know more about kind of our uh, well kind of uh, uh, the breadth um and um a diversity of how we're you know being innovative with mindfulness when it comes to um social innovation and also uh bringing it into um various industries whether it be um the healthcare system, um, emergency services and policing, um, and also into uh, the education system. Um, we want you to have some time to digest all of that and let that settle. And we want to offer just some space um, for you to reset. Uh, we'll come back in 15 minutes, and then we're going to experience the program that is behind all of the research we just talked about, behind um, all of the uh, uh, social innovation programming that we do, that we uh, integrate this program uh, to, you know, build um, and inspire um, change makers through mindfulness. Um, so, uh, Dr. Naruman, uh, what is fifteen minutes at your at, at in Thailand? <laughs> what what time should we come back? So now is at um nine twenty five. So maybe um nine forty. Sounds good. So take some time for yourself. Um, I know it's. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot happening, maybe in the home or um, at school. So uh, let this be a break for you for what you might need, and we'll come back to experience the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arlene, for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Arlene. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
All right. So we hope you had a nice break just to um, support yourself or take that time to just reset. As you come back, we welcome you to uh, return back to those traits that we invited you to explore of what you're bringing to this session, including curiosity, open-mindedness, that beginner's mindset, as we explore the Mindfulness Ambassador Program. So the program itself is 12 sessions. Um, typically, when we are um, facilitating this program, uh, it is with people who might be experiencing mindfulness for the very first time. So our session begins with Mindfulness Basics. Um, our program is very interactive, so we will be inviting you um, for uh, inviting you to be engaged um, and also just to see if you can notice uh, what might be distractions for the next at least hour as we engage in this session um, and see if you can uh, give your full attention, um, not just to the program, uh, but uh, actually to the rest of the participants who will be sharing and engaging um, and exchanging wisdom. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, our first session in Mindfulness Ambassador Program is all about mindfulness basics. And we open the session um, with a curiosity. Uh, so when you hear the word mindfulness or hold it in your heart or think about it in your mind, uh, what is one word, image, or thought uh, that comes to mind? And we'll invite you to share this in the chat box. What is one word, one image or thought when you hear the word mindfulness? So we have some beginner, uh, beginning shares of stillness, present awareness, breath and observing eye. Uh, for me, uh, I have a little bit here, kind of uh, my own view about the mindfulness. Uh, I think most of the time I saw my mind, the big something different that's come from the uh, conflict. If something start to fight each other, I can see both sides of a conflict. The mind is very strong. I will see how oh, that is a mind. mind. And what mindfulness come from the, if you have the right of a view, and then they, that will give me to choose, oh yeah, this is a mind and a, which way is the right, that is a mindfulness. Thank you so much for sharing your voice, Zhao Zhen. Thanks. And we welcome anyone else if you want to share um, through the voice, but I see everyone uh, being active in the chat box. So once you've shared, um, it's about, uh, we would invite you to come back to the chat and read everyone else's share. So what is the beginning you know, definition for other people around mindfulness? So you could go back to 1042 um, on the, or um, I guess it, on my end, it's 1042. On your end, it would be, I think 942 with Jim Sion and then Sarah, and just taking some time to see the different definitions um, no right or wrong, but to be inclusive of all those definitions of mindfulness, from relax to consciousness to being present and breathing in and out. Thank you for that, for that beginning definition. Thank you, Natalie. So the program begins with the first session, introducing council guidelines. If we were gathered in person, in community, we would be sitting in a circle. We would be sharing space and removing the hierarchy of facilitators or instructors being at the lead. And instead we would give space for each person's voice to occupy the same space in the room. 
So the council guidelines create the condition for us to engage in dialogue in a way that um, honors each person's experience and creates space for each person's wisdom and lived experience to be brought forward. So the first guideline that we'd like to share is to speak from the heart and to use I statements. So you will find throughout the program and throughout perhaps even our time together today in the first session that we might invite you when you share to reframe your share from the I. We have a tendency sometimes to say we. Um, if I was to reframe that from the I, I might say I have the tendency to sometimes speak from the we. The ask here is to really create the opportunity for each person to speak to their own experience rather than generalizing or speaking to other people's experience. And in doing that, we create space for others to share their own experience. Thanks, Sarah. And our second guideline is speak only when you have the talking piece. Um, so as Sarah mentioned in person, uh, typically we would use a talking piece or an object that would be placed in the center of the circle. And when you would like to share, you would go um, and grab a talking piece uh, to indicate that you are the speaker. And the talking piece um, with the object uh, represents um, uh, almost a connection to everyone else in the circle. So when you're holding the object, or I guess online, it would be unmuted. It was imagining that there is a string from that object or the person who is speaking to everyone else in the circle of a connection of the other people listening. So in our sessions, we value listening just as much as sharing. That's beautiful. And that brings us to the third guideline, which is to say just enough. Um, here, the invitation to say just enough for some who arrived to the program may be to say a little bit less if you tend to share a lot. And for some, this might be to be brave and courageous and say a little bit more if you tend not to feel um, as though you'd like to share. Within this is also the right to pass. So the option to always say no thank you, or to pass, or to not share, or to partake and participate in a way that honors where you're at today. And then the next uh, guideline is listen respectfully with an openness to multiple perspectives. So um, our program isn't uh, when we share or invite uh, perspectives. Uh, our goal is not to convince others um, and make them uh, agree with what we share. Uh, we are here to hear as many diverse um, perspectives and thoughts and ideas and to let them um, have space um, for all of us to sit with and to listen um, and to respect. Mm -hmm. So what is shared in the program stays in the program. And that is to honor people's personal shares. People may share personal stories, whether in small conversation, we will move into breakout rooms at one point and or in the larger group. But what we do want is to encourage participants to take from the program what is learned. So what is shared stays here, but what's learned can leave here. Mm. Thank you. And the last one is uh, completing the takeaway practices and come prepared um, at the next session. So even though we're only having one session today um, in our fuller program, uh, we always like to name that we only have 60 minutes to invite these uh, concepts and themes and the practice really happens when we integrate it into our daily lives. So we uh, share takeaway practice to continue uh, growing and learning. Mm -hmm. And before we move on, we always like to make time uh, to see if anybody else would like to add a guideline uh, as we share space. Um, together, if anybody would like a guideline where they feel something is missing from um, 
the guidelines in front of you um, that would be respectful and uh, create a safer and braver space, uh, you could share that in the chat box and we'll make sure to share it with the rest of the group. That is beautiful. We're now going to move into our theme. So the beginning of this session, now that we've set the stage with arriving and arriving in community, now we arrive into the theme of the session, which is Mindfulness Basics. Our theme is spread out over five slides, and we are going to read through these slides together as a way of learning and understanding and then making meaning of. So I would like to kindly invite five people um, using the Zoom feature of raising your hand. So if you go down to the, um, the participant list, um, you are able to raise your hand. Um, you can also do that with the reaction. So the react tab where the heart is, you can um, scroll to the bottom there and raise hand. So we would invite five volunteers who feel comfortable reading and then one person will read at a time and we'll continue to move through. If you can't find your raise hand feature, you can also um, please have, feel free to chime in by the chat. Or Natalie, I don't know if you can see everyone, I can't see everyone, but um, you can raise your actual hand if you'd like. <laughs> Xiao Zhan is one. Xiao Thank Zhan. you, Xiao Zhan. Lovely. Thank you. And we need four others. So let's get all five before we begin. Mm -hmm. Who else would like to be a reader? Ah. Um, Did we say that right? Thank you, Sitasini. Uh, Pearl. Pearl. Yeah. Number three. Number four, who would like to offer? We have Frau William. In the chat, thank you. And I could do the last one, Sarah. Oh, thank you, Natalie. It's such a lovely way to shift the narrative from the facilitator voice to bring in um, all of our participants' voice. So thank you very much. All right, so who was beginning? Natalie, you were keeping good track here. Yeah, Xiao Zhan. Oh, oh Xiao Zhan. Yeah. Thank you. So you can unmute and then you can read for us. Oh, you don't even have to share your screen. You can just read from our screen. Although contextual adaptations look fascinating. <laughs> Uh, we just need you to unmute. We can't hear you yet. There we go. Oh, yeah, yeah. I already sent the, my PPT, share my PPT. Is that already there? Oh, no. So you don't need to share your screen. Natalie's going to share the screen, and then you can read what is on Natalie's screen. There we go. So you're going to read this for us. Thank you. Oh, you, you asked me to read this, uh, same metaphonics basics? Yes, if, oh. if you were comfortable. You also have the right to pass. Yeah, metaphonics is a way of uh, being and seeking. When we are mindful, we focus our attention on what is happening in our body, our mind, and our environment in the moment is very important too. With mindfulness, we love in the present, focus on what is happening right now. The intention is to see things as they are, rather than as they used to be or as we wish they could be. We notice what the mind is judging experiences as positive or negative, fire or on fire. Oh, to my uh, to my liking or disliking. Thank you. 
And who was next? One more? No, no, you, no, no. <laughs> no, that's why we got five volunteers. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have... Uh, Sidasini. Sidasini, I believe. Sidasini. Yes, thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Sarah. So in case in the future, you can feel free to call me ARM, maybe make your life a little bit easier. So, okay, let's continue reading it. Uh, themes of mindfulness basics. Sometimes when we judge, we are resisting what is true in the moment. We may cloud our experience and create worry, stress, and suffering. With mindfulness, we learn to notice these judgments. Let them go and observe the experience for what it is, clearly and accurately. With this quality of attention, we learn how to be present for anything, every gift and every struggle life offers us. Thank you. Thank you. And who's next? I think it's um, her. I think, her? yeah, uh, the third one. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Mindfulness exists inside every one of us. It is not something we need to create. Rather, it is a, it is a practice we need to cultivate. The idea is to deliberately slow down and bring more awareness to the mind and body in the present moment. It's about observing our thoughts, feelings, and sensations we're already experiencing and acting on them with discernment, kindness, and compassion. The objective is to view the experience with more, more focus and to reflect and respond with greater clarity and less reactivity. Thank you. Thank you. And Fra? Uh, I think it's me now. Is that right? Oh, thank okay. you. Okay. So, uh, hello. Uh, uh, on, the on the other hand, when we are not focused in the present moment and are preoccupied with thoughts about the past or the future, we are more likely to function on automatic pilot. On, on autopilot, uh, we let our old stories and habitual actions govern our experiences, and we may react uh, thoughtlessly to a given situation with our concern and compassion for others, uh, for ourselves or others and the environment. Thank you. Thank you. May I be the last one? Oh, yes. we would love that. Yeah. Natalina? Oh, nice. yeah. yeah. Can I start? Mm -hmm. Mindfulness is like the ocean. Even when there are big swells crashing on the surface, down at the bottom, it is relatively still. With a mindfulness practice, we can learn to find the same stillness deep within ourselves while the waves of emotion thought and external experiences wash over us. With mindfulness, we are not trying to get rid of our thoughts and feelings. Rather, we are learning to look at the experience as it is, is unfolding moment by moment with more awareness and acceptance. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for layering in your voice and thank you to each of you who shared. So we're now going to invite you to reflect on the theme so Natalie here is going to kindly start back at the first um, slide. Thank you, Natalie. And provide us an opportunity and moment just to perhaps reread or to reconsider what's been shared. And her invitation here is for you to consider a word or a sentence or an idea that resonated with you from this theme. And we're going to invite you to bring your fingers to the keyboard, to move into the chat, and to begin to share the word, sentence, or idea that resonated with you. And you can just hold on once you type out what you'd like to share. And then in just a moment, we'll ask you to press enter, and we'll let all of those shares waterfall through the chat. So we'd like to create space for you to think, for you to reflect. Okay. 
we'll give you just another moment. And then as you're ready, whenever you are done putting your thought, your sentence, or your idea in the chat, we will invite you to press enter. And then we will let all of those thoughts and ideas flow through. And as you share, once you've pressed enter, yeah. we're going I to invite... Oh, okay, go ahead, yes. Yeah, I write down one sentence when I uh, read all of them. Uh, uh, I feel in the mindfulness, it is the big ocean. That's so big, even I think the mindfulness is kind of like a big forest. So my mind is all like a monkey. So one day I bring my monkey and go to the city. The the monkey not to get used to. He always, you know, jumping down up and down, go everywhere. Cannot find out where is his place. So after I get a meditation, I feel there is so big. Even a monkey don't like the ocean, but he's joined the big the the place. And then finally. One can find out the big place, the forest, it is his place. So meditation and the kind of is uh, make him very calm down because when there is so big, even he can go anywhere. And then that is a peaceful kind of feeling about my feelings too. Thank you. Oh, Shizhang, thank you very much um, for sharing that. Um, so actually, we're going to invite now what we refer to as web style. Um, and Shaojang, because you shared first, I'm actually going to invite you to scroll through the chat and look at what other people in this space have shared. And through the web technique, what we do is we invite you to get curious about somebody that you would like to hear from. So perhaps somebody shared something and you'd like to hear a little bit more about why they shared that. And then you're going to take the talking piece as if we were holding a talking piece. And we're going to invite you to gift the talking piece to that person that you'd like to hear from. And then we will invite them to speak. Remembering that people have the right to pass and if they choose to pass, um, then we'll invite you to get curious about somebody else. So who would you like to hear from? Um, okay, I choose uh, uh, Jatila, and then uh, Obasas will be next. <laughs> this is all my team. So the three of us is uh, from my team. Okay. Jatila, are you ready to share a little bit? Ah, Shatila, would you like to unmute? Maybe he's not ready. Um, it's okay. My idea. I think, I think, yeah, there you go. My idea. Oh, you just muted. You just muted you your, uh, your, your voice. So you need to... Turn on your voice. Yeah, got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the way of the learning the mindfulness technique, uh, we have to be being present moment, uh, whatever uh, we choose, whatever we do, and um, without harming any other being, uh, we, we, cre we can create and uh, cultivate and uh, so many things I think yeah, 
useful and hopeful uh, meaning the taking the, the focus in the mindfulness meditation technique at the end. Thank you, Shatila. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for sharing. And I'm going to invite now um, um, Madalena, who put Thank a note you. in the chat. Yeah, please, let's move the talking piece to you as our yeah. last share. I would like to say that mindfulness is a very, very useful tool. When we are serious into our meditation and we want to know what we are doing, is it really true? Because I have been practicing in um, Northern uh Northern Thailand Temple, a very famous uh, teacher. And I have been learning since 19 years ago. And I got addictive, but not addictive. I would say it is guiding me to continue my passion. Actually, it's a dedication to to practice um, inside knowledge meditation, which is Vipassana, we call. And basically, it's the mindfulness of our body, uh, feeling, and then thoughts and our mind object. So what I... What I want, I realized that mindfulness is so useful because that is a very useful tool that can help us to let go of our defilements. Whoever wants to transform as a human being to a holy being, like we, we have the level like a sainthood, like a full level. So if we want to transform, we want to purify ourselves, we really have to use this is the best techniques because when we uh, follow the sila, which is we practice. Um, the precepts, and then we we practice the uh, we follow the precepts, and then we practice meditation, and then we will get wisdom. This is the rule, which is true, because when we practice correctly, we will get the wisdom inner from ourselves, even without us expecting. But that inner wisdom would guide us to let go all the. Actually, I would say step by step, not all the not all at the meantime, but step by step, little by little time by time will help us to release our defilement. This is, I experienced that. That's why that was the only meaning why I have continued and I will never give up. Yeah, until, I mean, as much as I can breathe, I will continue to do this practice because it's very useful. We can feel more relaxed and happy in life and stay away of the suffering, basically. And this is, a, it's a, it's, it was my dream in the past, but now I think, this is the truth because I really feel it because I have practiced with my whole hearted intention. So I think mindfulness is really useful. Whoever wants to not only to relax or stay away of the, um, I would say the trouble in life, but if they really want to detach the suffering, that is the best tool for my opinion. Yeah. And even, even Buddha say that it is the only way, but, it is up to any one of us if we can practice it accordingly, wholeheartedly. This is the, uh, every one of us is different. So that's why it it's really depends on what we are looking for. Yes, I think it's an option. That is another difference because some people, they think they mix up the samadhi, the tranquility meditation with the inside knowledge, we pass on meditation. I will say that when the samadhi meditation, the tranquility meditation can let us calm and feel peaceful and maybe feel happiness like that. But inside knowledge, Vipassana meditation can transform us to release all the um, defilements, to transform a human being, like to purify our heart and mind to be a holy being. I would say anyone can enter to the sainthood because in the Theravada Buddhism, we have four levels. It's even the beginner, the Sotapanna, which is whoever, a, achieve that level already needs to reborn only seven times, seven lifetimes. And the second is Sakadagami, which is reborn only one more time. We will, will become, uh, do not need to come back to the world. And then the third level, which is Anagami, which is do not need to reborn again to the world. And then the last one is Arahanta, which is eternally in Nibbana. So this is a process, but of course we need to take time and fully dedication and faith, I would say, but every step through for my experience, I would never disappoint it because I just see the progress. So I feel very thankful. Yeah, this is my what I want to say today. Thank you so much. Thank you so That's much.
All right, we are now going to, um, there's so much wisdom there to harvest and we want to dive a little bit deeper and build on what's been shared and what's been brought forward. Uh, so thank you. So there's so much I, I, we sense and we hear um, so many ideas and wisdom um, coming up in the theme of mindfulness. Um, and you might be familiar with John Kabat-Zinn. Um, he is um, uh, the person who created or brought um, a Buddhist meditation in, and transformed it to mindfulness here, or um, I guess uh, I would say not created, but um, introduced it to the West through uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction. And this is one of his quotes. Um, his quote is, you can't stop the waves, um, but you can learn to surf. And I feel, um, Madalina, you were speaking of this already in your sharing of, you know, um, uh, you, you or finding peace and um and wisdom through uh mindfulness and insight meditation um and learning from um the experience of hardships um and struggles so we want to invite a few more voices uh what does this quote mean to you um so you can't stop the waves but you can learn to surf um, and you could raise your hand and maybe we have time for two voices or you could share in the chat box. What does this quote mean to you? You can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. taking some time to just reflect on that quote. Anybody have any, uh, maybe it's an image, maybe it's a story. Oh, great. I see some uh, shares in the chat box. I'm going to read it out loud. Um, Gim says to ride on the opportunities and scale greater heights instead, in, uh, instead of allowing ourselves to be drowned by it. Thank you, Gim. And then for, for Ntifa, waves, problems in life and learning how to handle it. Thank you. Anybody else, when they hear that, anything coming up for you that you want to share around? I see Pearl sharing, we can change the environment, but we can change ourselves. Thank you. Rose says, uh, but we can be friends with it. Yeah, so befriending the changes. Um, that was Rose, sorry. And Pearl was stress and unpleasant experiences are inevitable, but we can befriend it. And Kesrin, changes are permanent. They don't define, uh, don't defy it. Learn to manage them. <laughs> Thank you. So with that in mind, just recognizing how mindfulness helps kind of um, build that resilience within us. We can see from people that they're sharing, uh, you could build resilience by um, gathering wisdom, um, by uh, leaning into impermanence, um, befriending. And then Sumedha shares, um, as everything is arising by its cause and conditioning and not done by me or for me, we could not make it, but we could handle it with acceptance and noticing, um, I think what uh, Sumedha is trying to say, respectful attitude. So with respect and acceptance, yeah. And you not, cannot stop something happening, but you can learn about it and stay with harmony. Thank you, Jean. So just sitting with everyone share. Thank you so much for everyone sharing. 
Oh, Yang, uh, what a beautiful way to end some of the closing. We can change the mud to lotus. Yes, um, that is a very classic um, idea of changing the mud to lotus. It makes me think of uh, Thich Nhat Hanh um, and some of his teachings. Um, before we go on to the next dialogue prompt, a question. Um, I, I just want to share what Madalena shared in the chat box. We should not be influenced by others' opinions when they are not beneficial. We should acknowledge them and know them as they are. That, so bearing witness to what somebody might be sharing. So we want to now invite you um, to share a time when you learned how to surf the waves. So what was a challenge that you experienced or maybe you wanna think about it of being in the mud and you turned it into a lotus, okay? So we're gonna do this in breakout rooms. We're gonna open some breakout rooms, maybe in groups of three or four just in case some people aren't available to share, there'll be enough of you in the room um, so that um, you can share with at least one or two people. I'm not quite sure how many people can be present in sharing in conversation. You're, work, you're welcome uh, to conversate in your own language um, if you don't wanna speak, uh, if that feels more comfortable. And so the question that you're sharing again is, Share a time when you learned how to surf the waves or share a story when you turned mud into lotus, into a lotus, okay? So I will give you, um, I don't see it, there's a timer, but we'll give you about, <clears throat> let's say um, seven minutes, about seven minutes in your group, and then we'll come back after, okay? Um, the prompt is in the chat box if you forget. <clears throat> we'll see you on the other side. So we're opening the rooms now. <clears throat> Right, I see a few folks here. Can we help you um, arrive into breakout rooms? Natalie, if you make me co-host, I can share um, as well. Yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't, I don't have access to that, unfortunately. Okay, no problem. So folks, um, if you're still in this room, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you should have a button that says join breakout room. And if you click on that, it should take you to the room you've been assigned. Some of these um, folks might be um, stepping away from their computers or not here for the moment. Yes. Just gonna eleven twenty seven. So if you can't get into room into the room, uh, please let us know. Um, I can try and put you in a room. Um, if not, then you have the seven minutes just to reflect to yourself. Um, and uh, on the prompt, it's in the chat box. Share a time when you have learned how to surf the waves or when you turned mud into lotus. And Sarah, I'm just um, a moment to... Um, review just kind of the time left we probably <laughs> can you tell that I'm like doing the math <laughs> yeah I don't think we'll be able to go through the whole session template but I think, no, I don't we think can... we'll be able to at all but that's okay yeah I think we'll be able to um 
maybe end and maybe talk a little bit about um I think just like the overview of the session and the program. Um, and then if we have time and maybe not, maybe it's just a question and answer. Um, if we can't, if, if there is enough time, maybe we jump to trauma-informed mindfulness. Um, yeah, yeah, we most definitely can. I think we should leave, um, if we can, 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. At the end. I think it, they are um, yeah. a keen and actively participating group, which is so beautiful. Yeah, I agree. And everyone is in their room. So I think they're having, oh, here, let me assign. I see a Venn. Sign to remind. Okay, great. I love hearing all the different perspectives and shares. <laughs> How are you holding up, Sarah? Okay. I'm pretty good. How are you holding up? Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm really, this one's for the books. <laughs> yeah. I, you know what you are in your groove and you are such a gift and a joy. I think I took like 10 pages of notes while Arlene was sharing. I feel like I learned so much about the pieces of the organization, but, um, you have great energy in the evening, Natalie. I admire it greatly. <laughs> I go to sleep usually like two hours ago. So <laughs> Um, I am usually in the same boat. This okay. is me finding um a third or fourth wind. Okay, I love it. Oh, how many minutes was this? Oh, it was a ten minute conversation. Okay, there was a ten minute timer, so oh. um, maybe I'll just leave it as that so that they don't get confused. I'll just um. What I noticed was missing. Um, in this session is the quote, um, the intro quote. I know, you know, I, it's true. What is that quote again? Mindfulness is the awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by. <laughs> I'll have to bring that, find that slide again. Yeah, no, it's all good. Um, and Thursday night was good. I mean, that was last night. <laughs> it was. I see someone by themselves. I'm just going to move them just in yeah. case. Uh, move to room seven. Maybe I'll just close the room maybe in one minute. Maybe that's a lovely idea. Okay, one more minute to share. If you're back, we're just gonna wait another minute or so. Um, for people to finish their conversation in the rooms, you might have come back from the room. I hope that you had um, within your group some time to speak with others. I'll close the rooms now and then I'll have 15 seconds for them to come back. Oh, well, let's stop the share for a second, maybe. Yeah, let's be in community. I like that.
Welcome back, everyone. We apologize if we cut off any conversations. It's nice to see some faces. You're welcome to um, keep your video on. Um, we always like to come back after breakout um, just to the larger group um, without any slides as if we were coming back to circle. We hope that you had um, um, a nice time listening to other people's stories um, and uh, noticing what stories came up with you. Mm -hmm. And this is when we harvest the wisdom. So without sharing anybody else's stories um, and any specifics, what were some key concepts or um, wisdom or insights uh, that came up for you when you were listening? And even from your own shares. So we're going to do this popcorn style and we're going to invite three voices. Um, anybody who would like to share anything that uh, they appreciated from that conversation, any wisdom that you want to share back to the larger group? I, I will jump in if that's okay. <laughs> of course, that's um, okay. Thank you, Fra. Yeah. Uh, I, I just had a, uh, in our, our breakout group, there was just two of us who were communicating and uh, I uh, met a new friend from China. Um, and uh, we were speaking about this idea to do with um, learning a new language. And um, uh, and I found that uh, I've been living in Thailand for around 10 years now, so I'm, I'm a constant uh, Thai language learner, you know. And um, we were speaking, about, well, I was speaking about when you're in a, a social situation where you come across new vocabulary you haven't heard before and and so you you sort of uh, you feel quite lost and uh, there's a very strong emotional reaction for me anyway where I feel this sense of failure you know and you know I should gosh I've been here for so long I should be able to know what they're saying you know all of this kind of this whole story um, and then that's, so that's the mud and uh, I guess the lotus is just kind of stepping back and I guess looking at the big picture about it all and and realizing that it's unreasonable for me to expect to know every single <laughs> word in in the Thai language just because I've been here for 10 years and you know and and see it as you know the the classic sort of idea of you, you have to make these mistakes but there are opportunities to learn you know and to learn new vocabulary or whatever it may be so um, that's what uh, came up for me and um, and it was, yeah, that's kind of what our focus was, just to do with learning a new language, strangely enough, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Fra. Um, Thank, I, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for I, listening. And I love that there was an opportunity to meet someone new um, in, yeah. in your group um, and that connection there and that, there was some, um, through that conversation, uh, shared experiences uh, that created a sense of connection. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience. <laughs> so um, thank you, Fra. Let's include two other voices. Yes, I see uh, Forn Tifa, please. We'd love to welcome your voice. Oh, you just have to unmute. <laughs> I like my friend Kim Kim Chong uh, to conclude that. I think you you from Singapore, Kim Chong Ong. Yeah, that's are you me. from where are you from? Yeah, I'm from I Singapore. Didn't ask. Singapore, okay. I'm from Texas. <laughs> yeah. In Texas, okay. You will you present? Yeah. yeah. So part of that, uh, I mean, both of us were in the group, so we were talking about. Um, I I think one of the things that we all agreed was on the on the issues on life and death. So um, so my friend here on Tifa, she she reflected on the. I mean, during the COVID period, it was really challenging for her because it was a lot of unknown. Um, a lot of stress um, and a lot of helplessness as well. So um, we had to just, to some extent, merely follow the instructions. But I think at that time, we also learned to put faith in the administrations. We put faith in the signs, on the people who work really, really hard 
So although she has, you know, she humbly, you know, she was very humble. She she felt that, you know, she wasn't of much help to contribute. But I think the very fact that, you know, to allow herself to be isolated, not to go out, you know, it actually takes a lot. So um, so that was what she shared. And I think um, you know, that 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 was actually a very, very difficult uh period for all of us. Yeah. So uh yeah, I, I think you know it, it's not about how much we do, but it's about how much you know we you know we are able to 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 press on, to persevere on, and yeah, and, and believe. I think I think that, that's quite powerful. Yeah. And then for myself, um I think um because I, I went through the standard first aid course. So it's a first responder training. So it's actually scenario based, but it's actually very, very stressful. So um, for example, when we have to deal with a casualty with a cardiac arrest, we just have to swing into action. We have no time to, you know, to be distracted by you know, the many things that's happening on the ground. And, you know, we have to remember the rhythm because it's, it has to be about 100 beats per minute. So one and two and three and five, five. And it's actually very, very tiring because we have to continue doing this until the paramedic arrives. And, you know, at any point in time, you know, I couldn't allow myself to be distracted. Yeah. And yet at the same time, we need to be mindful of the surrounding. Yeah. So, so it's actually... um. I feel that was actually one, one very good training. I learned not to procrastinate and just, yeah, I just have to work on it because I'm trained to do that. Yeah. So you just have to ride that wave. Yeah. So, so you know, and I mean, both of us in our discussion, we talk about this. I mean, we ponder over this, um, the, the issue on life and death. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to add to that at all for Antipa or? Uh... I would say both of us really uh, have faith and uh, consciousness. Whatever that, whatever serve, you know, the serve you call, whatever problem, just like when you get into the ocean, this is like unknown, right? So you have to be conscious. I able to handle this. I can swim. I can handle this. So you have a faith in yourself. You have to have consciousness, mindfulness, insight, meditation, and then you can handle it. This okay, breathe, swim, handle it. That is the objective to go back <laughs> to the shore, <laughs> handle it. So mindfulness is would be the way that you when you face the the big issue like life and death. Like when you see unknown, like COVID, what is it? The people die. And we cannot handle it. No vaccine, nothing. So that's the time I feel like whatever I learned in my life is useless. I thought we're going to end up the end of the world <laughs> that time. But then I know uh, the administrator, doctor can handle it. So it's a fate and uh, consciousness that I, I would say I practice a lot on that period of time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Diva, for adding. Um, thank you for adding uh, Gim as well too of of um, your experiences with turning the mud into lotus um, and and that experience of life and death. Uh, we'd love to add uh, if there's time one or two more voices. Um, anybody else would like to share any wisdom? Yeah, I would like to. Can I? Yeah. Can I share some? Of course, uh, Amanda. I would, I would like to share from my own experience. Just now we had a discuss with our group. Exactly, uh, we cannot stop the wave, but we can serve it. We can serve from the wave. As, a, as my experience, exactly, serve in the wave is already a result. It's a through long time practice. We can reach the certain stage, no matter how big wave there, we can handle it. We can serve along with the wave. But I think um, the first important thing is, as my experience, whenever the difficult situation happens, or the waves appear in my life, first, uh, I do ask myself, I do introspection. Uh, what is word? I should learn from that. It must be something 
I should learn, I should to improve. That's why this work, uh, this uh, difficulty happened to me. And uh, with this introspection, I could find something from my own personality or from my own spiritual practice, something I'm missing. So the first step, I will do the introspection. And I, and I think during this process, the quality of tolerance is very important because sometimes when we're very strong, if we don't have enough wisdom, but also lack of tolerance, we will, we will join in the wave. So I think the ability of tolerance is very important at that moment. And uh, the one more point, how to deal with this uh, situation as the our group also discussed, we have to understand the truth of nature. There are three characteristics. So no matter what happens, no matter emotion, no matter the thoughts, or no matter any incident even occurred in our life, it's uh, by cause and condition. It's, uh, it's impermanent. It's non-self. And initially, maybe it's, it looks like just to label it, just the thinking. But through practice, this label, this understanding, the deep root into the mind. So the mind deeply understand the situation, everything happened. It's because it's not of me. It's like a phenomenon. It's like uh, the wind comes, the cloud comes. It's like changes happen in the nature. The nature changes outside. Same is also change inside. Change inside happens like emotion changes, thoughts changes, and everything happens inside, external world, uh, internal world, exactly. They are like, uh, they are like uh, same phenomena, but in a different uh, perspective to appear. And last but not least, most important, we have to deal with this situation by meditation practice, because uh, once the meditation practice to train the mind more stable, more stronger, so only that we can when the difficulty comes, the mind can stable like a stone, hold it. We not, uh, we not go with the wave. We not uh, falling into the situation. So the mindful practice and the meditation practice become very strong support to cultivate the ability to face the situation. And the one more thing is during the whole process also should keep in the mind is keep the precepts because normally when the big wave come, mostly the mind know enough strength will be break our precepts. But once the precepts breaks, the mind, uh, the strength of mind also will break. So at that moment, we should do introspect. I should do introspection and be tolerant and keep the precepts, continue to practice. That is the way to overcome the difficult situation is the way to train ourselves to serve in the big way. Thank you so much. So beautifully said, Samina, and we appreciate you um, using the I voice intentionally. I, I, I could sense that uh, with intention there, you uh, restating some of your statements through the I voice um, and just through a few voice uh, stories. And I'm sure there's um, so many stories that were shared in that 10 minutes or seven minutes together of expanding or uh, reflecting on um, all the natures of mindfulness that um, each of you shared in this larger group from um, compassion to um, impermanence uh, to beginner's mindset. Um, but I think we're landing at a, um, at a spot where Samedha highlighted the importance of the practice um and and i know that uh, gim also mentioned that that there there's a practice needed and so this actually brings us to the next part of our session where we now get to experience a practice so notice what came up for you in sensations i know sometimes it's not easy talking about hardships the mud that we experience in life and maybe you are experiencing something uh, in your body, in your heart, um, in your mind. And so we will sit with a practice from Sarah. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so many rich shares. Thank you for um, 
for so bravely conversing with one another and then for sharing back some of that wisdom. Um, okay, so we are going to now move into a practice. We are going to invite you uh, within this practice to first find your place and space of comfort. And as you arrive in that place and space of comfort, I will give you a little bit of background on this practice. Um, this is the same practice we began with today, but um, we invite you, you know what, just a few hours later to notice how this practice feels different. Uh, now that time has lapsed, now that we have gathered in community, now that we have learned and grown together, and perhaps you'd like to turn your camera off so that you can be fully focused, or perhaps you'd like to make an adjustment in your environment so that you can be more present. If you are multitasking, if you are taking notes as I like to do, um, just make a few adjustments in your environment so that you can be more present with this practice. And as you do that, we invite you to consider the practice of Tusa, as Natalie so kindly shared earlier on the origin of the practice, the origin of the name of the practice. And just a reminder that Tusa refers to the idea of slowing down, creating a bit of space between stimuli and response. And just thinking about the power of that space like the anchor of a ship, building upon the metaphor of learning to surf and swelling the waves, Tusa can be used to help us steady in different situations. Even if big waves of emotion like anger, sadness, fear, and excitement overcome us, we can use our breath to regain a sense of calm and balance. And in time with practice, we can develop and strengthen our capacity to steady our mind and body in all conditions. So you arrive in a place and space for practice. We invite you to sit in a comfortable position, perhaps feeling the earth beneath you. Inviting the soles of the feet to the floor if that's available. Feeling the earth supporting beneath the body. Resting your hands on your thighs. And just allowing your shoulders to drop. If it's available to you, you may close your eyes. Or perhaps you choose to look for a reference point. Somewhere on the floor or the tabletop in front of you. Just a focal point to return your gaze if you become distracted. Invite your spine to grow tall and noble, like the trunk of a tall tree. And as you find length and space in your body, invite yourself to notice how the body feels right here, right now. Invite your focus from the body to the breath. Begin to notice the flow of your breath.
You don't need to breathe in any special way. Trust that your body knows how to breathe. Simply notice each breath coming into your body with the in-breath. And notice the breath leaving the body with the out-breath. Feeling and connecting to the rise of the breath. and to the fall of the breath. Maybe you noticed your mind become caught up with thoughts, emotions, or even body sensation. Reminding yourself that this is normal. But the practice of mindful awareness is noticing the distraction and then choosing presence by bringing yourself back to the breath. Notice any draw or pull to judge your experience as positive or negative, or perhaps that desire to attach any label. Rather, greet your practice with kindness, with inner and outer compassion. Being kind to what arises in the moment. Allow each in-breath to be a new beginning. And allow each out-breath to be a gentle letting it be. As you awaken back from breath into this place and space, shifting your focus from your breath back to your body, checking in once again to notice how does it feel to be right here, right now. Slowly bringing your attention back to your surroundings if the eyes were closed, awakening them back. And then if you arrive back at your screen, at your device, back into community, we invite you to think through a moment of reflection on your own practice. And in the interest of time and hearing everyone's voice, we are going to invite you to bring your fingers to the keyboard, to the chat, and in one word, we invite you to reflect on your experience practicing TUSA. There's no right or wrong answer here. It's simply what arises for you. Seeing if you can harvest 
in a way that greets yourself with that same compassion and non-judgment. And taking a scroll through the chat to notice and consider how everyone's feeling or what came up from peace, the feelings of emptiness, refresh, non judgment, more peace. And as you continue to share and you continue to harvest, we now invite you into the last moments of this program and first session together. And that is the takeaway practices. So the program has a takeaway practice for each session. The takeaway practice begins to help participants build the muscle of being more mindful, of learning to pay attention with attention, and to begin to notice when the mind becomes distracted with the goal of skillfully redirecting attention with purpose. The practice of Tuza is one of the practices we offer as a takeaway, or the option of take five, which is taking five breaths. Um, another practice that will be shared on the Global Minds website that you will be provided. And those takeaway practices would come back in the next session and be harvested together. And to close um, our session, we're going to close in gratitude. So we will imagine that we are in a circle. Um, and also because of time, we're just going to share one genuine message of thanks um, in the chat box. Um, it could be thankful for someone uh, di directly to someone who maybe shared a story with you. Uh, maybe it's thankful for the time, thankful for the university, whatever comes to mind. Maybe it's thankful for someone in your family who is maybe taking care of the kids or being mindful or making you breakfast, whatever it might be. Uh, what is one message of thanks uh, to close our Session one, um, Mindfulness Basics. And so imagining um, being together and we would be all Passing the talking piece, sharing one message of thanks. And remembering that sharing or listening or uh, making people feel seen and heard um, is equally important in this session than sharing. So just going back to read everybody else's shares of thanks and also how they're feeling in the moment. Uh, I am very happy uh, from this glad. Uh, I got uh, many meaningful idea and uh, uh, theory and I imagine uh, how to start my next education plan and <laughs> Listening from this class, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Jatila. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Ajahn. So that concludes. Um, I see people continuing uh, to share their yeah, messages you. of thanks. Uh, we want to close with just showing. Um, uh, we only have five minutes left. <laughs> Um, that was only session one. This program is 12 sessions. Um, and this is the uh, a visual of all the sessions so that we will share this with you. 
Um, so just so that you have an understanding of what our full program looks like, it actually has three pillars. Um, the center of it is the secular mindfulness practices. So we teach Tuza, take five, which is very similar to breathing practices. We teach mindful eating, body scan, and loving kindness. And then simultaneously in our 12 sessions, we learn, we teach social emotional learning through the council format that you experience of sharing stories and also sharing your perspective on quotes and the theme. And so you can see here on the left side, the program topics, we start at the bottom, mindfulness basics, and we go all the way to uh, mind mind body connection we talk about emotional intelligence emotional triggers how to handle conflict all the way to finding compassion and being the change and in the middle in the colored slots those are the five pillars of social and emotional learning so we we through the programs everybody uh, is learning simultaneously how to nurture self-awareness how to improve self-management, to develop social awareness and acquire relationship skills, and then make that make those responsible decisions, not just for the self, but for the community. And then on the right side are the different skill developments that happen uh, throughout the 12 sessions. So that's an overview of our program. I know we don't have that much time for any questions or thoughts, but we do want to use the last little time. If anyone has any comments or uh, questions, we have some time left. So if um, the student would like to learn more about your program, um, so you have the program available as well, right? Correct. So we do this program. We're also we do it online. So we certify we certify people how to facilitate this program. So if you wanted to teach the twelve sessions, you can take our program. Um, I can share with you, Dr. Naruman, this the um the link to our website and I also just it in the chat, Natalie. Oh, yeah. amazing! And also the yeah. slides. So all the slides as well too. We can share. Okay. Yeah. So it seems like we're almost at time. We just want to say thank you to everyone. Okay. Thank so, you, everyone. Thank you also. So I, I would like to take this opportunity to conclude and uh, we as a international Buddhist study college in Mahajula Longkorn University in Thailand would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to the Global Minds Collective team led by Associate Professor Dr. Aline McDougall and Natalie Martes and Dr. Salah Hunter. So I think it's very insight knowledge for the mindful social innovation and also to that experience. And I would like to say thank you for your invaluable time, dedication, and your insight and guideline. Mm -hmm. Have greatly enriched our understanding, and we are truly appreciative of your contribution. Thank you for inspiring us for your continued effort and in and in advanced health, mental health, and social well-being. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's very wonderful, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good Thank rest. You. See you next time. Thank you. See you. Thank yes, you. We're looking forward to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Be happy. <laughs> May the Buddha bless you. Uh, thank you, everyone. What a wonderful gathering. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. We're going to yeah. go bedtime. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> Don't get back. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Good night. Have a good night. Thank you. Mm, you too, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.